From party promoter to hip hop A and R to EVP of Interscope Geffen A and M, Joey Manda ascended to the top of the record industry by following a lifelong commitment to get as close to the music as possible. This is his blueprint. You drop out of high school in 11th grade. Were you giving any thought to what the future would hold at that point? No. When I dropped out of high school, I was working for a friend of mine. He was throwing parties. People like did it for a few years in, in high school and then they went off to college or they had a strategy and they went off and went to live their life. And for a while it was perceived that I was a loser because they're like, oh, Joe, so Joey, yeah, you're still doing that, how huh? you still, still going to the club, still working, you know, still throwing parties. Where were these parties at? Well, they were in Brooklyn, kind of local neighborhood parties, underage, and then he made the jump and he started working at the Palladium. And he had Saturday nights in the Palladium, which was the bridge and tunnel night, and they played house music on the main floor, and then we had a hip hop room. I kind of became the king of the hip hop room. Jessica, who managed Flex. This is Jessica Rosenblum? Jessica Rosenblum, yeah, who managed Flex, who's, you know, like an OG New York club legend. But she let me start working the door at the tunnel on Sunday. So I was going anyway, again, just to hear the music. You saw everyone from Big to Nas to Puff to Jay. It was like a groundswell moment for rap music. You know, it was great to see the artists, but I always studied the people with the artists. Like, Chris Lighty had a huge effect on me because I would see him at the radio station and he would come through with Bone Thugs and Harmony or LL Cool J. I didn't even know anyone that worked at a record label or had any, you know, legitimacy in the, in the music business. And like, seeing Chris and seeing how he moved, seeing how the artists treated him. He's not a rapper or a producer or a DJ, but he's in this just as much. And I don't know if it's subconscious or conscious, but I was like, I kind of want to be like that. Growing up in Brooklyn, I wrote graffiti, so I fought with other kids over graffiti. I mean, I had a crew and I had people that were down with me, but most people were kind of the enemy, and everything was always so adversarial. And when I got into music and I started meeting people, gotta be like, you know, super cool with anyone that was in the music business. I always heard it was about networking, so I was always extra nice to people, even though a lot of people were dicks, but I was, you know, <laughs> trying to be cool. You don't make beats, you're not a DJ. Are you assessing your own skill set and figuring out like well I'm really good at this and I'm really good at that and Flex kind of did that for me he was kind of like you pick really good beats and you, you're really good at calling records and he was like yeah I think you should do A&R and I was like that'd be incredible like can you help me with that so he he signed this deal with Def Jam and then he started bringing me like he was bringing me to the meetings and I, I didn't I never even asked why you never had a conversation about no he was just like going. oh I'm going to see Kevin and Lior and Todd tomorrow, meet me in front of Def Jam at 11 o'clock. So I would get there at 10.30 and he would get there at 12.30. <laughs> so you're a and this record for Flex and you've been working for him for years now and you're not making a ton of money. Are you cognizant that you're paying it forward? Are you thinking about that as... At that point, yeah, once I, once I started working on the Tunnel album, got, you know, access to Def Jam, then I'm like, yeah, I'm building to something. That was a pivotal point for me, where I was like, oh wow, if I do a good job on this, this could lead to more. As you're learning more and the curtain's getting pulled back, are you falling deeper in love with the music or is it losing its, its luster? It's getting better. Flex was on the radio, so he'd be like, we need to cut Nas on that song that we have. You know, I've been trying to get him to the studio. He said he's gonna come tonight at 10 o'clock. And I'd be like, well, you're on the radio until 12 o'clock. How's that going to work? He's like, no, you you be there. <laughs> I'm like, I you think maybe you should be there because when he comes in, he's probably going to want to see. He's like, he's like, nah, it'd be cool. He's like, he just he's going to come in and do a verse. He's like, it's fine. And I'm like, okay. So we were at Mirror Image in Times Square, and Nas comes. Sure enough, I couldn't believe it. And he walks in. I mean, I had met him and seen him before. I didn't really, you know, again, never worked in a recording session and never, you know, never A and R anything. So he's like, pull the beat up. He says, ah, oh, it's cool, all right, yeah, I'll fuck with it. So then he goes right into the booth, engineer can't keep up with Nas. Nas gets super frustrated, so he walks out of the booth. He's like, yo, tell Flex I can't fuck with your man right here behind the board, like I can't do it. He knew as he was telling me that he was never ever gonna come to the studio again to do anything <laughs> for this album, and I knew it, and everyone in the room knew it, and I was like, yo, Nas, please, we just need you, man. Like, like we need you on this album. He was like, all right, man. He's like, but your man gotta keep up. Like literally, and he walks back in and he finishes it. So again, that was invaluable 
learning experience for me. I never used an engineer that the studio recommended again, unless I knew them. I always brought my own engineer after that that I knew would be ready to record Nas or, or Jay or whoever. The studio, that's, that's kind of the real office. That, that's where the, the most important work happens. I still get excited working in the studio. I mean, when you put artists together in the studio, or artists and a producer, sometimes the session's not gonna go anywhere and it's not gonna turn into anything, but sometimes it's gonna be an incredible song, an incredible project, an incredible album. The studios is where it's really happening. Joey had learned how to put an album together on the fly. But his real challenge as an A&R came in the form of a mandate by Lior Cohen to find the next big names in rap. So you have this one credit under your belt and a huge amount of information now. How do you transition from that to striking out on your own working at Asylum? In 2004, Lior Cohen left Def Jam and went to run Warner Music Group, which is Atlantic Records, Warner Brothers Records. He had a vision in his mind when he went to Warner. I want to make sure that I get the next cash money, the next rap a lot, the next no limit. So I want to have a distribution service, but more than a distribution service. I want to have a distribution service with a little bit of taste that can super serve entrepreneurs. So Todd hired me to do, it was called A&R, but it was really everything. We did everything. What is the challenge of this, this role and of the company? The challenge was uh, something from nothing. People go, you know, go to labels and you have a roster and, you know, you usually have some some acts or something to fall back on, some artists that are that are good. Superstars, if you're lucky enough, when you get to a label or they're, they're great developing artists, you know, Asylum was basically like zero roster. But you can have this and, hey, eat what you kill. Go find some great entrepreneurs and companies to distribute and artists. Go for it. We made more out of it than they expected us to. We went out and got Juicy J and Hypnotized Minds, then we went and got Swisher House. Then we went and got Trill Entertainment, which was Boosie and Webby. We signed Cameron, because he had left Def Jam at that point. So we got Cameron and, and, and um, Dipset. Paul Wall and Mike Jones was really like the breakthrough for Paul Wall and Mike right? Jones were huge, yeah. I mean, when we signed Mike Jones, I think we did two million albums on his first album, and nobody saw that coming, nobody expected it. Still Tippin' had been out for a year, and everyone in Houston and everyone in the Southwest was kind of like, yeah, that record was the shit, but it's toast now. And we took it national, and we were like, no, nah, this record, if we, you know, if it gets exposed to the rest of the country and the rest of the world, it's gonna be something. And that's what we did, and it was something. So personally, you, this is your first time that you have a job that has health benefits, yep. and you are a full-time employee in yep. the record industry. Not making a lot of money. And how, how old are you? I got hired at um, Asylum when I was 30 for a modest salary. And again, you are looking at all of this as paying it forward, that this is somehow going to all pay off? I no. wanted to compete with A&R guys at every major label that were making five times what I was making. I was like, oh, okay, now I have signing power. Um, I have my mentor friend who's running the company. Oh, now, I, now I'm going to go kill. Now I'm going to show people what I can do. And what, what, when you look back, what are the biggest achievements from that? that time at Asylum? Yeah, at that point, there was no guarantee. I mean, if Asylum didn't work, it would have been a blip in the radar. They were worried about Atlantic and Warner Brothers. What was your personal challenge to yourself? What did you hope to get out of this job? No, I just wanted to put up hits and sign artists that, that became big. That was the goal. How did your time at Asylum come to a close? We folded into Warner Brothers in, in uh, the fall of 2010. They wanted me to run the urban part of the company, so we brought all the Asylum artists over with us to Warner Brothers. They hadn't been a major force in urban music like you know Atlantic was at the time, or Def Jam, or anybody like that. So we went to Warner Brothers, and that's when we kind of decided, like, we need to take this up. Now we're par part of a major, and now we have to do, you know, now we have to take it up a notch and do bigger deals and not just kind of like street rap music. So we did the, the MMG deal with Ross, and that was great. We got Wale and Meek and a great partnership with Ross. Every label was, was trying to get the deal, and, and he believed in us. So how do you go from being the man at, in urban music at Warner Brothers to being the president of Def Jam. Now I had been at Warner Music Group for seven years and my contract was coming to an end. Lior and I didn't agree on <laughs> what I what I should be compensated and Lior was being Lior and he didn't want to pay me what was fair market value. This is a, a change in your sort of attitude towards things. This is the first time in this story where 
money has motivated a decision that you, you've, you've made? Yeah, because after a while, after you pay enough dues, at some point, <laughs> you have to reap the benefits. What told you that at that point in your career, it was time for you to, to sort of take your chips off the table? You pay your dues for a certain amount of time. You, you have a certain amount of success. You make a certain amount of money for other people. You make a little bit of yourself, but part of growing up and really maturing and being a leader is realizing when you need to take care of yourself and make sure that people are being fair with you. So it's a part of being a big boy. You gotta grow up and make sure you're getting treated fairly. I got a call from, from Barry Weiss, who was running the East Coast of Universal Music, which included Def Jam. I went and met with him, and they offered me the presidency of Def Jam. Pinch myself moment, it was pins and needles, it was incredible, and I took the job. And this is coming on the heels of Jay-Z having been the president, so those were the shoes you were filling? Please don't say that, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I was the next person after, I mean, after Jay-Z to have the job of president of Def Jam. <laughs> We've had a different trajectory since then. You have to write your raps. Yeah, I have to write my raps. I have to use a pen. That's the problem. <laughs> you had a, a short but very successful run as president of Def Jam. During that period, you dropped the, the Nas record, the Frank Ocean record, a Kanye album, Cruel mm -hmm. Summer, Two Chains, and then it came to an end very quickly. They were calling me the president of Def Jam. It didn't feel like I was the president of Def Jam. It felt Why like um, it felt like Barry was really running the, the thing, and that's kind of Barry's style. And not a knock against him, but it wasn't the. I didn't ask enough questions, so when I got there, he and I, or we weren't on the same page of what I was going to be doing, what he was going to be doing, what other people in the company were going to be doing. You know, I put my head down and we had some success, like you're saying, and you know, we signed Vince Staples together, which was awesome. Janae Aiko, who Dion had signed, I championed when I got there. I thought she was incredible. What was the moment that you knew that this was not going to work out? Day two. Really? Yeah. When I first got there, I just, I kind of sensed it. I go off vibes, I go off gut. You feel what's, what's emulating from the walls. Mm -hmm. Like, I got it. This is the first time in your career that things are not playing out exactly how you had wanted them it, to. It was the first step back. It was the first step back. To the public, it didn't seem like a failure, I don't think, because of the success of the artist that under your tenure. Yeah. But privately, you felt as though this was a bit of a fail. It was definitely a failure to me. I didn't really affect any great change, and that's an L for me, either way. You sort of engineer this move from Def Jam, which is owned by Universal Records, to Interscope, which is also owned by Universal Records. Mm -hmm. So clearly, the sort of corporate overlords are seeing the value that you bring to the organization in general, despite that not yeah. being necessarily the best cultural fit. I was ready to be unemployed. I was ready to, cool, I'll go, you know, I'll go figure it out. It's so important to me, and like, I take this shit so seriously. It's not like I was like, let me figure out plan B. Like, I was just like, I can't do this. By the grace of God and the powers that be in the universe, I was able to move to, to Interscope, which was a blessing. We did a gut renovation a year ago, ripped out the walls, ripped out the desks and just tried to make a forward-thinking workspace. But right now we're trying to get everyone in the same room for more collaboration and more of a creative process and a, and a better flow of information. I, I think it's paid off. Again, it's just a constant theme of staying close to the music. Joey had climbed to the top of the pyramid, but saw his presidency at Def Jam as a misstep. Trading teams to a new role at Interscope allowed him to rebuild, rebrand, and rebound. When you get to Interscope, what is on your short list of things that you want to get done? When I got to Interscope, John Janik, who, who used to own Fuel by Ramen, he had just been named president of Interscope. Jimmy Iovine was still the, the chairman, and he was, he was all about affecting change. I felt that energy, and it was a different vibe when I walked in the door. Hope it was about building the best team, really starting with the executives here, seeing who the great young executives were, moving some people department to department, figuring out, okay, who's, you know, whose kind of time has passed and they should be doing this, you know, and who's never got a shot, and just kind of like reinvigorating the staff. Also, kind of retooling the roster, what artists should be here, what artists, you know, had, uh, that they're, you know, that they needed to move on. That was my whole first year, two years here. One of the most important things, I think, for being an A&R is 
having a personality that you can disarm and leave artists relaxed. I would meet them and say something from a song that I thought was dope, and that usually went a long way. Like in any situation, that still goes a long way. Like if I see an just artist and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was listening to, like right now I'll text the artist and just, you know, randomly and just be like, just text some of their lyrics and they'll be like, oh shit, like you fucking paying attention. Like, you know, that's always, that, that's really what artists want. They want to know that besides people just listening to the, to the melody and the beat, that you're really listening to what they're saying. Like it's, it's important to them. You have your team in place and you now have a, a roster that you feel like you can work with. What are the next steps to building what Interscope is today? You know, everyone's looking at Playboy Cardi now and Black. I gotta make sure they live up to their potential. I'm part of the team that does that. But I have to think about, you know, in 2018, who's gonna be our next Playboy Cardi and our next Black? A lot of your successes have come uh, by virtue of your relationships and the way that you network and connect with people. Have you always felt that you were a people person? Anytime I get near somebody that's creative, that I'm a fan of and I, and I think they're dope and it could be somebody who's a huge artist and an icon who I get in a room with and I'm like you know I could talk to them about how their albums have affected me or you know their lyrics or it could be somebody that walks into this office and plays one song because they're trying to get signed and I'm just like wow you're fucking incredible that's when I feel like I open up those are the best situations for me and it's so rewarding to me to just be near talent like real talent you said that early on one of the most important things was making sure that you were nice to everybody and you know trying to leave a good impression and manage those relationships are you still hyper conscious of trying to manage each of those your relationships kind of ebb and flow with people sometimes i have to take a position for one of my artists and defend them and it could be defending them against somebody who i've known for 20 years who has a different artist or a different producer and a di you know and they need to protect them the same way you know i'm here to fight for artists so sometimes you can't keep a good relationship with everyone when you're fighting for your artist is there anything that you are hyper conscious of when you think about missteps that you've had or things that haven't worked that you think is sort of an endemic character flaw that you have to work on? You would look at artists that I've signed that haven't worked out, you know, that haven't had commercial success and you, you'd look at that as a failure. The times I look back on and that I really think about are more when I had a chance to meet an artist who was special and I missed it and they went on to be great someplace else. That to me, those, those are, you know, those hurt more. When you think about your own characteristics and attributes a, as a person, what do you think the most important are in terms of what have allowed you to succeed within the industry? I wanna be the best A&R person and executive in the music business and that's what drives me. Maybe some of that's fear and, you know, and maybe that's because I don't wanna lose the position that I'm in. I want it the same way you know, when I would stand outside the tunnel in 1993 and it was three below zero and I was making $125, I wake up with the same mindset today and a lot of people say that but it's not true, but for me it's 100% true. I wake up every morning and I want it more than anyone else does.